what is up youtube welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then just welcome to my channel it's not welcome back because it's your first time you get what i'm saying so just welcome go ahead and hit the subscribe button you won't be disappointed today's video is going to be about herbert herbert was a bad guy okay i'm sure you weren't expecting anything other than that y'all i know i've been gone i've missed y'all i'm i promise i didn't miss y'all but honestly i'm so careful of the energy that i transmit as well as the energy that i receive and that i put myself around and i have not felt up to uploading at all so i don't want to sit in front of this camera and film if i just can't give you the best of me and good energy and positivity like i'm not gonna do my girl like that i'm not gonna do you like that i care about you today mama is back okay with a new story and a new look and uh without further ado let's just get into the video herbert richard baumeister baumeister i think that's the one i know if it's not y'all gonna let me know zan in the comments he was born in indianapolis indiana on april 7th 1947 let's see what that makes him he's an aries this reminds me of a comment y'all this person hopped into my comment section and was like anyone from any zodiac sign can be a serial killer with a little eye rolling emoji and it's like girl duh people really are insane out here but anyway back to my point he's an aries and it's undebatable Okay. He was the oldest of four children born to Dr. Herbert, who was an anesthesiologist, and his wife, Elizabeth. His childhood was reportedly very normal. No abuse, no crazy stuff going on, no trauma. By his early teen years, he began to exhibit some very antisocial behaviors. And uh, it just got progressively strange from there. Cause he began obsessing over very vile and disgusting things like dead animals and well, dead animals. He developed a fascination with them. He would play with them. Like, I don't know how. I don't know if he was holding their little arms and making them dance or what he was doing, but he would play with them. But uh, homie didn't stop there because there was an instance where he went to school and he urinated on the teacher's desk. Child. He also once put a dead crow that he found on the teacher's desk. This, of course, scared the other children off, so they wanted no parts in herbert's activities or shenanigans they began distancing themselves from him they were afraid honey he became very disruptive in class and volatile and just now with all of the things teachers decided it's time we contact this boy's parents because he just can't keep going on like this so they reach out to his parents for help and at that point the Bowmeisters, they had already noticed a bunch of changes in their son themselves because he didn't just turn off the crazy once he left the schoolhouse. It ain't like the bell rung and then homeboy just went back to normal. No, his parents sent him to be evaluated and it was determined that he was schizophrenic and also suffered from multiple, dis multiple personality disorder. Now, they were on the right track by getting him, you know, checked out. Unfortunately, he didn't receive any further psychiatric treatment. It was just like, this was wrong with him. But my girl, what y'all gonna do to fix it? Like, nothing. In 1965, after high school, he attended Indiana University. And then from there, he drifted to a bunch of different odd jobs. Homeboy didn't mind going to work, but he had these strange behaviors that just did not quit. He worked at the State Bureau of Motor Vehicles for a period of time until a situation where he urinated on a letter that was addressed to the governor. And, um... There was already a mystery floating around about who urinated on the supervisor's desk. And so when they call him urinating on the letter for the governor, it was like, Miss Girl, it's you. And and <laughs> this won't be tolerated. And so they fired him, rightfully so. After losing that job, he went on to work at a local thrift store. And he liked his job there. He actually was pretty good at the thrift store. You know, handling the lightly used, slightly abused items. Y'all, today's cocktail is pink lemonade vodka and seven up i'm gonna have to take it a little easy because that, that pink whitney she sneaks up on you girl and she likes she likes to be seen and heard and felt so back when he was in college he met a young lady by the name of juliana at the time that they met she was a high school journalism teacher and then she was a part-time student at the university of indiana and so he saw her she saw him and then they locked eyes and they got together juliana loved him flaws and all she looked past all of his strange behaviors and she just saw 
I don't know what she saw because I never read really any of his good qualities throughout this this research into the story but she saw something in him and so she was with him the couple wed in November of 1971 and together over the course of their marriage they produced produced they produced children together she loved him I love Hoppo God knows I do and get this over the course of their 25 year marriage y'all they had only been sexually intimate six times Miss girl, what was you there for? Like, I don't understand. Like, was it stability? Was it, he ain't have no money like that. Like, I don't understand, but nevertheless, I'm just here to, I, I'm just here to, I don't make the news, I just report it. I'm just here to tell you the tea. Now, a couple of years after they married on into the seventies, when people supposed to be living it up, having a good time and smoking that reefer, at least I guess that's what they were doing. I would now. Yeah. Juliana reaches out to his parents and she tells them that he is, quote, hurting and he needed help. Herbert was committed to a psychiatric hospital by his father where he spent two months. Now, the specific events that led to this institutionalization, <laughs> big word, they were unclear, but, you know, it had to be bad if little Juliana couldn't even look past it this one time. Whatever happened didn't ruin his relationship or his marriage because Juliana loved her husband despite his odd behavior. When he came home from the hospital, she was there waiting to love him some more. She was a ride or die. So after treatment, Herbert came home and he told his parents, you know what? I'm going to act right. I, 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 I'm going to act right. I'm going to act right. He asked him could he borrow $4,000 and he wanted to open up his own business and they figured, hell, that might be your best bet because you can't work at somebody else's job peeing on their desk. Like, maybe you won't pee on your own desk. Maybe this is a good idea. So they let him borrow the $4,000 and he opens up a thrift store, which he names Save-A-Lot. Not to be confused with the Save-A-Lot grocery stores. This is a thrift store. Fast forward to 1991, the Bowmeisters, they purchased their dream home. The business is going well. They just trying to live their best life with their little children. And so they moved, oh girl, my eyebrows are not. It was an 18 acre horse ranch called Fox Hollow Farm. It was in the upscale Westfield area, just outside of Indianapolis in Hamilton County. They moved on up to the east side which that might not be the ease but you get what you get what i'm trying to say here it was a large beautiful million dollar semi mansion girl it was the tea it had all the bells and whistles including a stable and an indoor pool so they was really living it up let me tell you something the most trying decision i have to make all day is which color setting powder and which setting powder you use life be so stressful bro it's just so stressful around here i'm just sick of it I'm sick of how hard life is bro i'm sick of the stress by this time herbert had become this remarkable professional highly respected man who had a successful business a nice beautiful family and uh who gave to charities because a portion of the proceeds from the save a lot thrift stores went to the children's bureau of indianapolis he was a charitable a charitable man i want to do a peach look today because i feel like i feel the sassiest sassy sassy i feel the sexiest in peach like i don't know i used it used to be green but peach just does it for me like peach and green are the two colors that i just feel so so cute I want to feel cute today. At this point, the business was doing well. It was booming. It was doing so well that the Bowmeisters decided, let's open up a second location. And so they did. And they were floating for a minute. But after that, things began to go downhill for the business. And it began to fail. And of course, this begins to take a financial toll on the family. Because, yeah, money ain't coming in like it used to. The strain on their finances began to take a toll on the marriage. And Juliana had started working at the store, so them working together also was just not, it just wasn't a good situation for them. Juliana said from the start of the business, Herbert had treated her more like an employee versus, you know, his bae and baby mama. And um, he would often yell at her and just be real rude, condescending and disrespectful. And it only got worse once the business began to fail. And she was starting to get sick of that shit. But she still was wanting to stay in her marriage and work it out, even though she wasn't getting the seat. In an effort to keep the peace, she decided, let me just take a back seat from the business let him run the show and when that really wasn't 
helping out quick enough she decided you know let me just take the kids and give him some space and so she began spending weekends at his mother's condo her mother-in-law's condo just to give him some space and I guess get herself a peace of mind girl ain't nobody got time to be around a man that always got an attitude because baby when I tell you you can't out attitude me and then that's just not good for the kids when we both in there about to snatch each other bald no ma'am no sir herbert would stay behind claiming that he was looking after the store child unbeknownst to julie her husband was uh not only looking after the store but he was cruising the local gay bars picking up young men and bringing them back to the house speaking of the house his thrift stores were known to be like very well kept very organized for a thrift store that's just what people knew about the save a lot and what they liked about it now his house was the exact opposite. Especially after Julie started to spend more time away from it. He was spending less time cleaning that motherfucker up. So things were not decent and in order. The only area that Herbert really cared about keeping up was the pool area. He kept the wet bar fully stocked, relatable. And he had all of this extravagant like decorations all around the pool. He even had these human sized mannequins like the ones you see down to the Macy's. It's like doing the weird ass poses and they got no hair. Those, he had those around in the pool because at all times he wanted it to look as though there was a nice pool party going and people were enjoying themselves, which is, is weird. It's very fucking weird. Now in 1994, the Herbert's 13 year old son, he was outside minding his business, doing what children do, playing in the wooded area behind the house and uh, he discovered a partially buried human skull. Now he grabs it, brought it into the house. Julie is kind of freaking out. She takes the skull in there to Herbert and he's like, you know, my dad was a doctor and anesthesiologist, which is a doctor. I'm not saying that they ain't no doctor downplaying the title, but I'm saying why would an anesthesiologist have skulls, sir? Like. I don't know, that didn't make sense to me. Herbert said that it was part of a, a display, like an anatomical display, and that after finding it in the garage, he decided that he would just bury it in the backyard to get rid of it. Now, surprisingly, Julie believes her husband. She believes this, and so she's just like, okay, and she drops it. Well, not the skull, but she drops the subject. I don't know what they did with the skull. Now, meanwhile, young men began to go missing from the Indianapolis area, and it didn't take long for police to notice that there was a pattern here. All of the men were young gay men that had been visiting the local gay bars, like, short, right when they went missing. But unfortunately, other than that little tidbit of information, they didn't have any other leads, any other info to go by, any other evidence, nothing. They just was like, okay, so... They were gay and they were down to the gay bar and then nothing. Y'all, my little newly vegan sister is texting me right now telling me that her, her urine now smells like veggie broth. Why? Why, Lord? Why? Now, police were struggling to both find these men and to make sense of their disappearance until they received an anonymous phone call from a young man who we are going to call Peter. Peter, Peter sounds like a, um, a wholesome name. Nope. Peter was a cannibal. We're going to go with Peter anyway. So Anonymous Peter, he approaches the police station to tell them about this unsettling encounter that he had with a man he met at a local gay bar by the name of Brian. Peter said that he had met Brian at a local bar, gay bar, and the two hit it off. The drinks were flowing. They were having a nice night. And then Brian decided to invite Peter back to his, his house for a nightcap and just, you know, keep the party going and the drinks flowing. Once they got back to Brian's house, Brian, he offered Peter drinks, but Peter was like, eh, nah, I had enough to drink down at the bar. And so I'm not drinking no more. Like this is it for me. Peter began to push up on Brian, filling up on Brian, telling him, you know, he looked good. He looked good and he wanted to see how, Never mind. let me just not because none of those lines, those are my lines. He initiates sexual contact with Peter. 
Peter's down. Peter ain't no prude. He came to party. He knew what it was, okay? He knew. But then all of a sudden, Brian made this weird request of Peter. He asked that Peter choke him while Peter also choked his chicken, if you get what I'm saying. And uh, Peter was like, what? But he was still down. Peter was like, you know what? I came here for a good time. So let's just see what that that's like. He agrees. He gets to choking on Brian just a little because, you know, he's a little scared. He's like, you know, I ain't trying to kill you. I just want to choke you a little bit for you so that's happening and then brian is like okay now my turn let me choke you while you also yank your noodle and you know let's just let's just both experience this now peter he agreed to let this go down he agreed to try it but uh shortly after brian began to choke him it became kind of obvious quickly that brian had no intentions of letting go brian was trying to choke him down to the finish line peter begins to pass out and luckily because he's a little bigger than brian he's able to overpower him get loose it also helped that he had not continued to drink once they got to the house so you know he was able to free himself brian he apologizes he's just like i just got a little carried away i'm sorry peter is freaked out but at this point he's like let me just play it cool so i can get out of your life peter gets out of there pronto now this encounter made peter very suspicious that brian was the guy the guy that he had heard about in the news you know where it spread that a lot of guys had gone missing from the local bars and so he was like this has to be a crazy maniac behind all of these missing persons the police also felt like, yeah, this is most likely the guy. Unfortunately, Peter could not remember like where the house was. And so the detectives actually drove him around the nice neighborhoods because he remembered the area, but it was dark. And so he couldn't quite remember exactly how they had gotten there. Now, unfortunately, because Brian Smart did not have a criminal record that police could find and they could not locate the house, they it was really nothing that they could do at this point. So Peter had to return to his regular old life as if nothing had happened to him. And then we're still going missing. A couple of months down the line, Peter runs into Brian again at a bar. You see Brian at the bar. Brian is like, what's up, babe? Now, this night, he made it a point to take down Brian's license plate number. He was like, nah, you ain't getting off this time. You ain't getting away from me this time. Peter takes the license plate information to the police, and he's like, I got this. I got this. And uh, police run the plates and find that Brian Smart's name actually isn't Brian Smart at all. It's Herbert. Herbert Baumeister. I had already put it together that this was our homie Herbert. Herbert the pervert. See, and not only had little Herbert the pervert been cruising the local gay bars, and let me just say I'm not saying he a pervert because he gay. I'm saying he a pervert because of the things he did to these men. He had also been taking them back to his house, to his little pool party, slipping drugs into their drink and strangling them with a hose until they were deceased. And then he would bury their bodies in his backyard on his own property and actually on the property of his neighbors too. Now police, they approached the property of the Baumeisters and they just casually asked to search the premises and uh, Herbert was like, nah. All they needed was for either Herbert, the pervert, or Julie to consent to the search to carry it out. So then they approached Julie and they're like, Miss Girl, we think your husband is a serial killer. Like, we want to search and see. Julie did not believe it at all. She was standing by her man. She was like, my man said no, so no. My husband would not do such a thing. Like, yeah, he weird, but this is not him. This is not the her, but I know. She wasn't with it. She stood by her man. I would have been like, what? Y'all think what? Why? Let me see. Like, I just want to know. What's the tea, girl? What, what evidence y'all got? If y'all got some evidence, if y'all can convince me, y'all can come up in here. You can't just show up and be like, girl, we think your man is a serial killer. And I'm like, no, I'm riding with my man. Knowing that he had all these strange behaviors already now right out the gate julie was riding for her man but when that door closed homegirl started thinking like there was that skull at one time like she remembered about the skull and she started to question like maybe they're telling the truth like maybe that skull wasn't what he said it was so now julie is suspicious and she is watching her man she started wondering like could my man be a serial killer is he a serial killer like maybe 
Maybe he is. Over the next coming months, Julie became increasingly afraid and like alarmed by her husband's erratic behavior. Like he got worse. He began having these crazy mood swings and he was just being an amped up version of his crazy self. Finally, Julie, she reached her breaking point. She decided she was gonna take her kids and leave. She filed for divorce and then consented to a search for the police to come through. Like, yes, Miss Julie, you better Girl, you better, you better, okay? The search actually went down while Herbert was away on vacation. We don't know where Herbert really was. He said he was on vacation. We don't even know. Now, while on the property, the police uncovered the remains of 11 men. It was bones everywhere. Once the grizzly discoveries were made, this hit the news and it was everywhere. Like everybody was talking about it. It was all over the news. And then Herbert vanishes. They're literally unable to locate him anywhere. He does not return to the house. Eight days after the news broke the story, on July 3rd, 1996, three campers in Ontario's Pinery Park made a gruesome discovery of their own. Lying next to a revolver, they find a body shot through the head with a three-page suicide note explaining why he took his life. It talked about problems with his business and his failing marriage, but there were no, no mention of the, the bodies found scattered across his backyard. It was Herbert. Now, this is pretty effed up because his death before any trial or any charges were brought about meant that he could not be charged for these crimes. And I think that's crazy, but that's the law. That's just the way things are for whatever reason. So he officially only remains a suspect in the murders of all of these young men. Based on the bodies that they uncovered from his backyard, they were able to trace him to a string of murders that happened in the 80s before they bought the farm. These young men were being killed and thrown about on the highway I-70 and just left there. And the time frame that they stopped being left on the highway is the exact same time that they moved into the farm, him and Julie. Ain't that crazy? So it's like he was looking for a property where he could hide bodies and that's why he bought 18 acres of land. Now we'll never know how many people he killed all together, but police estimate it to be more than 20. Herbert Baumeister has gone down as one of the most prolific serial killers Deanna has ever seen, but like kind of unofficially because he couldn't be charged. But we know he did it. Like, we know he guilty. Now, y'all, if I didn't mispronounce this man's last name, Baumeister, Baumeister, just, we just gonna say it's my accent. That's just what it is. So before you wanna leave a comment trying to correct me, don't. So that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you so much. Of course, I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments, sound off below. If you enjoyed the video, or if you enjoy my content, or if you just wanna see me again, girl, like the video, give me a thumbs up. We gotta counteract these haters, girl. Just go and thumbs up the video, share with a friend, and um, I will see you in the next one. Peace.